almost fashioned as a debate, uh, you can be for or against the motion, if I present the motion in that manner, is has India's emphasis on core infrastructure. You know, the, every day you open the papers and say we're building 40 kilometers of highways and so many ports and airports and transmission and Bijli and renewable. There isn't as much emphasis on schools, hospitals, primary health centers, stuff at the peri-urban, rural levels where infrastructure is required. And it has occurred to many people that as a nation, you know, nations prioritize, you can't do everything, you can't spread, there isn't enough butter to spread evenly on the toast. So probably we've, whatever butter we had, we've spread it on the core infra toast and not enough on the social infra toast. You could also argue that it is not the job of government or the public to do social infra. It is that a lot of people in India have not adequately, and I think I'm going to dwell on Ashish to make the point that social infra possibly in many parts of the world is done by charitable foundations and organizations out of a passion for building those uh, institutions in different countries. So whether one should blame the government, blame ourselves, blame our politicians, blame our bureaucrats, or say that even private sector hasn't done enough in terms of interest is the topic today. So I'm actually going to ask the debate to be opened with Mr. P.K. Sinha. He is most apt to, I suppose, give the most balanced view on the proceedings, not just because of an illustrious career in the, uh, in the IAS, but also from the apex position as cabinet secretary, advisor in the PMO, etc., etc., and power secretary, etc. So I just have a few questions. I'm not going to make this a very long drawn out affair. And I will ask the same question to each of the panelists. Uh, uh, Jagan, you're going to be next. And I'll introduce you when you're... Sina, sir, has India overemphasized core at the cost of social? Have we made a mistake as a nation? Over to you. Well, I think it's a very interesting question. And, uh, <clears throat> well, if I were to, you know, give the answer in very briefly, I would say yes. You know, and... Uh, uh, well, there, there are many reasons for that. Core infrastructure is very important and, you know, it's, it's more visible to the people, to the political masters. And uh, when you talk of roads, railways, airports, I, you know, uh, they run the wheels of the economy. So from economic development, economic growth point of view is very important. And uh, certainly it has got more emph emphasis than the social sector. It's not working. No, you just, you know, to give you some data, if you just look at the 23-24 budget, <coughs> the provision outlay for infrastructure, core infrastructure, is 10 lakh crore, right? Yes. And out of that, about 5 lakhs is just railways and roads. Yes. But if you look at the outlay for education and health together, the two together is about 2 lakh crores. So 2 lakh crore on education and health as compared to 10 lakh crore on core infrastructure. So I'm just talking of uh, education and health on, in the social sector. So you can, you know, this, 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 the data speaks for itself. And the reason, as I can see, number one, the in core infrastructure development is more visible. It's very important for the economy, for economic development, social sector. But, you know, as far as political emphasis is concerned, I'm not sure whether, you know, if by investing more on core infrastructure, there are more votes for the political parties or political masters. Well, you know, if, if, if more was spent on schools and edu education, which is mostly in the rural areas and the hinterland, perhaps that would have made a greater impact on the mass, you know, water base, people living in the rural areas. But, you know, uh, the fact remains and uh, that in, certainly there has been, if, if we look at some total, you know, uh, there certainly has been more emphasis on core infrastructure than social, social infrastructure. You have other questions coming up, we'll, so we'll pass the same question so I will okay. close here and leave it yeah, to others. We'll, we'll leave it. So I'm actually now going to, uh, uh, I'm going to keep uh, Rajneesh for the end of this question. After Jagan, I'll go to ask Ashish and then I'll go to Rajin to, uh, and then move on to the next question. But just a short introduction of Jagan. Jagan Shah is somebody I have been greatly impressed with. It's a recent friendship, but having chatted with him over long and understood the his passion for 
many things, but particularly his role as the director of the National Institute of Urban Affairs uh, as a culmination of very much more involvement over the years in this subject, uh, both as an academic, as an architect, as a practitioner, and, and as a policymaker. He's had an excellent stint as the director of the National Institute of Urban Affairs. So, Jagan, the same question to you. Have we overemphasized as a nation core over social? Um, thank you. Thank you, Vinayak. Uh, I, th I think, uh, as Mr. Sinha said, the facts speak for themselves. So, we, we clearly have overemphasized um, this development uh, of uh, core infrastructure. Um, I, I like the shift now in terms of the sort of semantics of investment in uh, especially transportation infrastructure as connectivity infrastructure. And I'd like to emphasize that I think there is a realization that um, the purpose for which this core infrastructure is built is to connect us to the social infrastructure that actually is um, is, is, is sort of keeping the productivity of the economy going and actually supports the health and well-being of people. Um, so we are at a kind of, I think we are in a, in a kind of a cusp where we are making that shift between realizing that the big ticket infrastructure projects which were also contributing because of construction and labor involved in all of this and the materials in, uh, that were consumed for, by this infrastructure, they were involved in kind of keeping the stimulus in the economy. But having said that, now the purposefulness of that core infrastructure is now being brought to the fore, especially by looking at outcomes that are achieved through that. It hasn't permeated the entire ecosystem, uh, uh, but having said that, I think we are with these kinds of questions going to make that <coughs> shift. So um, I guess the answer is, of course, yes, uh, and in unison with Mr. Sinha. Um, but uh, I'd love to have more of a discussion also now about how we are going to be able to now invest better in the social infrastructure because connectivity to that infrastructure has also been taken care of. Okay. Thank you. Question now passes to Ashish Dhawan. In this room, I don't think Ashish needs an introduction. But I have to say that if you speak to many young men and women today in corporate India and ask them what your life's aspiration is, they will tell you, we want to become like Ashish Dhawan. We want to be very successful in our first innings in, in the corporate world, in the world of business, money, investment. And then we want to transit to meaningful impact in society. This is what Ashish has done brilliantly in his life and I think stands as a beacon of what a lot of young men and women aspire to be. So you're a role model for many Ashish. And uh, so a lot of people I meet speak about you with very high regard and, and a kind of aspirational model. Ki waisa hona hai. Now, Ashish, as you know, has been the founder of Ashoka University. He has invested through his other foundations in schools and, and is now seeding many, many other innovative, impactful ideas. Many of his colleagues are in the room like Subra and Kangta and others. Uh, we are also very grateful in the InfraVision Foundation. He's been one of the more enthusiastic contributors to the foundation. But this question for somebody who has founded Ashoka University and has put in so much of personal emotional content in the school sector in this country, I think this is a question tailor-made for you to answer. Has India emphasized core at the cost of social? Over to you, sir. Uh, Vinayak, I'll actually take the contrarian view to what uh, Mr. Sinha and Mr. Shah were saying. I actually think for India right now, for the next 10 years, core infrastructure should be the priority. You know, we need to prioritize economic growth above everything else, um, is my own personal view. And that's where we'll get the highest ROI as a country. Uh, India needs to grow at 8% a year. And uh, I think Lant Pritchett has this paper, which some of you may have seen, which shows that, you know, per capita income and HDI, there's like a 0.9 r squared like a huge correlation so it, as your per capita income goes up automatically your education health improves you because you can spend more money you know etc so i i think at this stage as a country this is top priority i also feel it's important because frankly just more money into things like education capex is not going to necessarily improve learning outcomes you know and the amount required for very basic small improvement is actually quite small. Take Uttar Pradesh, which is doing a very good job in improving school infrastructure. The chief minister launched something called Kaya uh, Kalp, which is, uh, they're spending 14,000 crore. It's a convergence program where I think the state's outlay is maybe just 50% or more 
of that, maybe eight, nine thousand crore over three years. So only three thousand crore. The state spends about eighty thousand crore on education, which is largely on uh, teacher salaries. So what is required in capex is actually tiny compared to what the operational expenditures. You know, Mr. Sena was saying we only spend one lakh crore in education. That's true, but that's from the center. If you add up center plus state, we actually spend about seven lakh crore on education. So we are spending three percent of GDP. It's mostly again on salaries and on current expenditure. It's not on capital expenditure. I would argue if you take an area like education, which maybe I know better than health, I think what we eventually need as a country is we need to have better, larger schools. Our school system is too fragmented. We have too many small schools, and that's where the capital expenditure should go. I mean, the PM Shri schools is an example of that. Some states also have these model schools. That's an example of that. Again, the as an order of magnitude, the capex required for that is a tiny fraction of the 10 lakh crore. So my own belief is, you know, if you're going to spend 10 lakh crore this year, and maybe five years from now you're going to spend 20 lakh crore. Or, or 18 lakh crore, 17 lakh crore. Frankly, social infrastructure needs a small fraction of that because the capex is not going to make the difference to outcomes. And so we'd rather put the money into hard assets that actually drive economic growth at this stage of development. That's an interesting point of view. I was not expecting you to say this, but actually now that you have, it, was, it, it makes eminent sense that let's get economic growth engines going and that should eventually, you know, lead to everything else being available. Uh, the I've been holding uh, Rajneesh till the end. Mr. Rajneesh Kumar again needs no introduction. The iconic ex-chairman of the State Bank of India. But that was towards the end of the career. But over, I mean, having chatted with him, he's had so much exposure in his career across working both in India and abroad in State Bank that he's seen development bottoms up right to the top. So the question to you, Rajneesh. Same question. Yeah. I won't repeat it. So when you speak in the end, every point has been spoken. So, <laughs> But uh, my take again is that uh, particularly when it comes to social infrastructure, so it is a collective effort of a center and a state. And uh, education is still in concreteness, but health is purely a state subject. It is not even in concreteness. So when we look at expenditure, it has to be center and states taken together. Uh, second is, if you don't have physical infrastructure, suppose you build hospitals and if you don't have power, what will you do? Or if there are no roads and there are hospitals and schools, how will you go there? So it is a sort of a chicken and egg situation, I would say, because when you are spending on social infrastructure, essentially, you are spending in building up the human capital, which is very important. But at the same time, you need money. And money can come only when you invest heavily in physical infrastructure. So both are related, but it is that, as I said, that within India also, India is not one in that sense. So you have extremes like you have Kerala on one end or southern states, you have Bihar, UP, uh, which are lagging in everything probably, uh, both in economic development as well as health and education. So somewhere everything gets correlated, but uh, uh, you need to invest in both because uh, you build hospital if you don't have doctors who are well educated. So what will happen to that office? And uh, in education and health, there has been fairly good participation of the private sector in a different way. But we have to also be mindful of the fact that it has led to so many malpractices. So maybe this is not, uh, it may not be part of the question or maybe uh, you would have asked this question. But when we see corporate hospitals, all of us know that what is happening there when Doctors have a revenue target and uh, all sorts of malware. Similarly, like Ashoka University is an exception, but private colleges, you see what is their level of education. Uh, so uh, it's not an either or situation exactly, but when it comes to prioritization, 
the sustainable development can happen only when you invest heavily in social infrastructure but for spending that money quick gains can come when you improve the productivity of the economy through investment in physical so there is not a clear cut answer in this you can't have a verdict in fact uh, on this uh, issue if you pose the question that way that we will vote so it will be very difficult to vote for thank you so I, there seems to be some convergence in the point of view that ashish also enumerated while acknowledging what uh, mr pk sinha is saying the investment levels are completely not comparable but there seems to be a point of view that in terms of priority we haven't got it wrong let's get the basics going first before you know we we look at the other social sectors now ashish i'm going to start the next round with you i know you have some strong thoughts in this matter not just strong thoughts but also an action agenda which you and your colleagues are unleashing very methodically it is to increase the level of philanthropy in this country as we know much of the social infrastructure the iconic institutions that people send their children to abroad or even in india say the tata memorial hospitals or the tata you know the indian institute of science or tis etc india has had a rich culture of philanthropic contributions to build social institutions academic health research etc etc but i think you've been making the case that there hasn't been enough of it or maybe the time has come to do more of it so i'm going to ask the second round of questions by saying has indian philanthropy not delivered up to expectation simple question i think it's firstly it's very early um, i do believe we are at the very early stages of philanthropy see most wealth got crystallized in the last 20 30 years post 91 and really economic growth took off in the late 90s so most of the wealth got made in the 2000s and the 2010 so last 20 years and i think philanthropy follows wealth creation so i think it's but natural to expect that philanthropy will increase now uh, you wouldn't have expected it 20 years ago two is we have many good role models i think mr prem ji is a real role model in terms of what he has done um shivnather a number of the others in the it sector nandan all the infosys founders um and i think they're real role models and amongst the startups you know people like the kamath brothers from zero dha which you didn't have maybe 15 years ago i think there are these uh, i mean you gave my example but i think it's a poor example i think there are these examples of people who i think have created phenomenal wealth and want to give a large chunk of it back to society over the next 10 20 years and those announcements have been made publicly and apart from giving the money away i think they're also involved with their time whether it's the kamath brothers who are passionate about climate or nandan on digital public goods or mr prem ji building a university education so many other areas now health etc so i i think this is sort of unleashed a new wave where this has become almost an expectation you know we we started a new organization called accelerate india philanthropy to work with wealthy people to help them really because often people have a desire to say i want to give to gender i want to give to health but they don't know where to start but i believe you if you can get people started on their journey the intent is there it's just it's it's a second or third priority people are tied up with their business um they're always busy doing things but if you can show them good non profits or work that can be done i think more will get unleashed in the next so i'm very hopeful that the next 10 20 years we'll see much more money come from the philanthropic sector two is i think a lot of people are starting to realize that building the next school doesn't necessarily give you massive roi india already has one and a half million 15 lakh schools you can build one other great school but is it really going to make a difference i think a lot of people are looking at you know system change you know government is already spending most of the money in education or health how can you like the premji foundation has you know these field teams in 50 plus districts it's a great way where you set up these teams uh, an institution of excellence you partner with the district work with them help them improve the tatas have worked on nutrition the tata trust um, the piramals have worked with a lot of the aspirational districts so i think this idea of also philanthropists realizing that really the big player is government in, as far as social development is concerned 
And partnering with state governments, partnering with the center is the way to go versus doing your own little thing on the side. So I think that's the other big change that uh, I see. And a third one now is I think people are starting to think of ecosystem. You know, earlier, very little investment was made in our think tanks or other organizations. People wanted to see direct field work. You know, investing in policy change or advocacy. I think there's a little bit of that change. It's still very early stages. So I think apart from more money, it's also a question of how the money will get spent in the next 10, 10 20 years will be more strategic and quite different from the way it was spent in the last 20 years. Interesting. Thank you. Two important points. One, that we are at the beginning of the curve. And two, that the nature and that there is still very good evidence in India of people having come forward. And that the nature is also changing, which is something that you're fostering. I, I, I'll just go down the line. PK, sir, the same question to you. Private philanthropy for social infra. I think there are, as, as uh, he mentioned, there are some very good examples in India. Uh, but given the size of the country and the scale of the problems in the social sector, you know, uh, if you go to the hinterland, rural areas, particularly eastern India, you know, I would emphasize when we talk of the whole country, uh, you look at the averages of all indicators, whether economic or social, national average, or some of the de developed states and the eastern Indian states, you will find the huge difference. So it is the Eastern Indian states which have actually bring down the national average. So the amount of work or capital that is required, money that is required into social infrastructure in the country, particularly, you know, these East Eastern Indian states is humongous. And so, you know, the philanthropy is there, but there, there is more is required. Second point, I think, you know, apart where the money is getting, where, where, the, where is the philanthropic capital getting channelized? Uh, that is very important. You know, each uh, organization or individual has his own ideas about where he should be channelizing that money. Some kind of a, you know, if, if there can be some kind of a coordination mechanism or something whereby gaps are identified and, and you know, money goes into those priority areas, uh, that will be a good idea. Last point, you know, even look at this corporate social responsibility. Now, this is, again, relatively a new concept, but all the companies, private or public, they are long by law mandated to spend 2% of their profit. So that is also, like, and, and which is also going into, uh, you know, social sector, that sector development. So that is another, that also is an example of philanthropic capital. But, we, you know, in the government, we realize, Amajit will bear me out, that even the CSR funds of public sector, let me give you an example. 2015-16, that year, when if you remember, you know, we took up this job of building a girl's toilet in every school. Yes. You remember? In the country. And we managed to do that. Lot of money. In fact, most of the money came from this 2% CSR of public sector. There are some very big companies like ONGC with huge profits, IOC and ONGC and all. So there was a lot of money. And uh, so that that year we realized, at least I realized, that if we, if we, the entire kitty that we have, if we put the, the whole thing in, into one, you know, priority area, the results are very good. Okay. So that's what I'm saying, you know, philanthropic capital, we need a mechanism whereby the, the capital is channelized into priority areas, <laughs> rather than each individual or organization, mm. you know, doing their own thing and the impact it gets minimized, you know. That's an interesting point of view because philanthropists by and large decide what they want to do themselves. And you're making a case saying if there was some kind of a bigger format, then it would cha it would channelize many more drops to make it a bucket full. It's an interesting point. Uh, I'm just going to alert members of the audience. I, as I go through uh, Rajneesh and uh, Jagan, I'm actually going to draw the panel discussion. I don't want it to drag. But I'm I, in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to ask many of you in the audience to make a quick remarks on what you've heard and what your point of view on the on the uh, on the topic is so please be mentally prepared you i may just call your name so rajneesh yeah so one is that uh, about the corporate social responsibility and philanthropy by the corporates that is because on a scale so it is more visible 
but uh, philanthropy in the country at a smaller scale has always been happening we know that in many places such and such dharmarth trust so in a small way also they do philanthropy and most of the money of course is going to education and health health i think first and then education these are the two segments uh, which uh, attract most of the attention from government side there are benefits of the income tax many of the dharmarth trust could also be you know attracted by the <laughs> exemption center income tax act but uh, we have a network of ngos also uh, who are doing uh, i think uh, tremendous work in their field but our country again as sina saab said is so diverse and uh, per capita income was so low that whatever you do would always look like a drop in the ocean okay. it's a massive effort and any activity you take you will find that the requirement of funds is huge and availability of funds is small anything even like say for example cancer the fund requirement is so huge and uh, so much work has been done by many organizations but it is insufficient so uh, it will always feel that it's a drop in the ocean whatever government does or whatever the private sector does jagat thank you um i i think um, like rajneesh ji uh, just said um, philanthropy has been part of our country's sort of economy and culture uh, quite deeply for quite a while contributed to the freedom struggle and um, every district you go to a, a degree college is most likely been set up through uh, through a charitable trust uh, so you know there's been a huge contribution um, i call that sort of the first generation if i may or maybe it was a uh, you know um the initial generation but the new generation of philanthropy in the country has actually done something which goes unrecognized and i think government would do well to recognize that which is that they have developed the understanding of impact better than anybody else i can think of um i had the good fortune about 15 years ago to be a consultant for the tata trust that ashish mentioned and developed a strategy and presented it to mr ratan tata himself um the kind of rigor that we had to go through to develop one theory of change that government never has the patience or the capacity usually to do and perhaps a new type of public private partnership is going to emerge from simply government letting the philanthropy and private sector to bring in that rigor into thinking about how to make good value for money i think the parsimony with which charitable organizations and philanthropy tends to use money um is very aligned with the new thinking on value for money um you know and i think we should learn a lot from uh, you know what they have actually contributed thank you uh, we have about 10 minutes and i am actually going to broad based discussions because there are friends in the sitting around who have equally strong views and interesting views on the subject so very quickly amarjit is another iconic gentleman sitting in our midst the famous secretary revenue amongst many other things and his big book on development is also now scheduled for publication so amarjit over to you quick comments dilip i'm coming to you after that first just the evidence educating the girl child ashoka modi's book but the graph is very old japan south korea india bangladesh china turn of the 20th century japan had universal primary education for girls china korea and india were together in the 1930s at the same level 1960s south korea does universal primary education 1980s china does universal primary education for girls it took us turn of the 21st century to do that point number 1 point number 2 86 42nd round nss 1986 87 i'm not talking about 47 i'm talking about 86 87 69.23% females in rural india never enrolled in a school i repeat 
never enrolled in a school. Six plus females. This is not 47. This is 42nd round, 1986-87. The third statistic. It is true that, on, and I am mentioning about health, since the finance part also has to be responded to. We were stagnating on maternal mortality more than 400, infant mortality 60, around 60. This is at the turn of, this is again at around the time about 2005 or so, when we were trying to launch the National Health Mission. From that point, uh, uh, fertility rate and at of about 2.5, 2.6. Now, this is where some of the change, look at just in terms of numbers, why finance matters. Health mission from below a 1% GDP, which is much lower than the, the international average for health, to a little over 1%. 2020-21, infant mortality at 37, maternal mortality ratio at 97 from 403, and replacement level fertility achieved nationally. The point is very clear, finance matters. Much as we may try to wish it the other way. Number two, the deduction from this education, educating the girl-child matters. East Asia is as primarily a success of human capital and a proactive state. Rest of the things come later. The issue about what modality, you know, the instrumentality of financing by the state, yes. But if I look at Europe, the church and its role in promoting education and health, it was always this body outside the government-funded system per se. But having said that, so the challenge for us is, how do I improve the quality of outcomes from the instrumentality of state funding? That's where a lot of the, what Azim Premji Foundation is doing, I have been associated since its beginning, is to actually work with government schools to improve their performance on a very large scale, with some good results in some areas, not so good in others. So broadly, the answer to the two questions that you've posed one, yes, social infrastructure matters. And I think uh, there's a long way to, why do Navodaya Vidyalayas and Kendriya Vidyalayas do well? Ask yourself this question. Then you will say that social infrastructure needs more funds. Two, the second question on <clears throat> how much can CSR and other forms of assistance to public systems help? It matters not so much the money you bring in, but the professionals you provide to the system. Again, by evidence, Pradhan. Pradhan was an organization that funded professionals, not programs. It is the most successful NGO in this country ever. Good professionals of IIM, Ahmedabad, Calcutta and Bangalore joining Pradhan, going to rural areas, drawing program funds from local governments and district Zilla Parishad and others, and delivering good outcomes. More professionals from the CSR component, more support on that, that perhaps this is broadly where I stand. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. So, it's the efficiency of state-funded capital that needs to be improved is a point you well made. I'm going to, I'm going to move over uh, to Dilip Cherian. Dilip, your point of view on the issues we've just discussed. I think the biggest point of view, and I'm not saying this in a populist kind of way, is that... Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. We must have more women's voices heard on this issue. I'm not saying this facetiously. I'm saying that the entire debate might actually change in its content and composition and result if one looked and heard voices we don't hear adequately on this issue. We think this is a man's issue. Where should the money be spent? One. Two. I think... Uh, the elephant in the room we are discussing also is that very often it is easier for uh, big government to do certain kinds of spending and all of us know that, that to spend on infrastructure is um, in terms of managerial uh, capability or bandwidth easier to do than to spend on social infrastructure. So sometimes it is the convenience 
issue which triggers that change and and takes that decision and we need to be extremely conscious of that and recognize that managerial bandwidth should not be the constraint for taking the decision which may not be the right decision three to answer the direct question where should we be spending i tend to believe that infrastructure is where it ought to go for the next few more years the rest will happen interesting more aligned to the point of view that let's get that going properly and things so uh, having been uh, triggered by uh, dilip bhavna i was coming to you a little later but now dilip has pushed the envelope bhavna is an old friend of many of us she runs uh, a particular section of the world bank activities in delhi and over the years i have seen her passionately involved in the ppp side of the world bank's operations amongst many other things she's done but on this topic bhavna your point of view thanks uh, so three very brief comments first uh, i couldn't agree more uh, when the statement is made that gdp matters growth matters uh, i had the opportunity to really go down in andhra pradesh over the last 3 months to visit a lot of schools public schools and the hospitals at the at the at the district level and even lower level and i think what is very clear is last 3 years 12000 crores have been spent by the government on upgrading the school infrastructure a very famous program nadu nedu but when we went and looked at it the biggest worry i had was despite all the good work will it sustain because the state is facing challenges in terms of fiscal sustainability in terms of growth so growth is critical growth is critical to be able to continuously support the kind of social infrastructure that we are talking second um, i think we have to particularly more than any other sectors for the social part expand the word infrastructure because it's always seen as bricks and mortars and i think we are all agreeing to it it's the impact and the outcomes the more we keep talking about infrastructure it kind of gives us a mental map of thinking about bricks and mortars and i think that has to shift and the third point i want to make is that i think a uh, role of philanthropy is very very important in a large country like india the challenge that we are facing despite the fact that you have csr funds flowing is the scale and the impact there are very many good examples sprinkled around to see a good school here and a good hospital there but i think what the philanthropy needs to do is perhaps to be able to have a model which should be really embedded in terms of the right public policy to show the impact and the scale right now it's too fragmented too sprinkled around so to me i think the growth and public policy to achieve the impact is the way we need to have both the philanthropy private sector and the government come in so Th- saying, those are the three points you're saying this similar to what mr pk sinha said saying that can philanthropy and private charity work within certain broad frameworks of government policy to increase the bang for the buck it's a it's a thought because otherwise there are individual efforts which are the human the the largeness of the problem as has been explained often it disappears so i'm now going to ask somebody to represent the voice of indian industry we have sitting with us mr shrikant sumani chairman of sumani ceramics and a very good friend of the foundation this discussion about what private sector should be doing sir this format that format csr greater philanthropy what's the point of indian industry well i think thank you uh, vinay you know it's a great canvas that we painted together both from the uh, from the point of view of expenditure from the government as far as core infrastructure or social infrastructure is concerned and fading into the fact that csr is as important now let me come to the first point that ashish made that today we need to concentrate with the kind of environment that has come thanks to the pandemic and the uh, the geopolitical and the geo trade changes that has taken place that india has an opportunity and a great opportunity and unless and unless, unless and until we spend money in the areas where economic growth can be brought uh we will not get there but at the same time when we are talking of r- rural infrastructure or social infrastructure we can't spend one at the cost of the other 
because if you have an economic growth and if it, economic growth is to be only in the economic zones of growth, then that's not correct. I think the trickle effect from the rural areas to bring in value addition to the Indian economy is just as great as other industries can. So therefore, I find that there has to be a, a very balanced approach into the ratio of spending and the, and the, uh, the focus of spending between core infrastructure and social infrastructure. That's number one. Number two, when you come to CSR, five names have come. Ashish has given just five names. Premji, Infosys, Tata's, and two more. Now, why is that the other names are not coming? And I tell you, I'm drawing an analogy. Uh, it'll, be a, it'll be an analogy between NGT and CSR. Now, NGT, unfortunately, wants to control both input and output. What is the importance. The importance is to you say NGT, you mean what? The National, National Green, Green Tribunal. Yes. So they want to control the input as well control the output. Now what are you concerned with? You're, con- you're concerned with the output that you want. And CSR exactly is the same. Now we need to draw when Ashi said that this is a time when people have made money and people now will come into the fray of giving back to the society. But it doesn't happen because unless and until you draw out names who can actually contribute. Today, what's happening in CSR, that you can't use your company name, you can't new, use your, uh, your product and say that this company is there because it comes in advertisement. And that's not correct. It doesn't matter what, what the company does. The fact is that if the company is known for doing something by c- giving in CSR, let it be known. Let it be recognized that this company is doing it. Maybe an advertisement. Because that is when people come to know that here's a company, here's a family. However small or big they may, there is an intent to make a contribution to give back to society. So I think there needs to be a greater change in the thinking as far as spending is concerned. When it comes to economic growth, social e- uh, economic growth and CSR. That is what I would see. Thank you. So as I draw this panel discussion to a close, I'm just going to outline the format of the next few minutes. I'm going to take a last comment from Mr. Kiran Karnik, who is very well known in, in both corporate as well as social areas and currently is the chairman of Helpage, India's largest NGO. Uh, after that, after Kiran's over, I'm just going to draw the panel discussion to a close by asking each member to make one or two very quick closing comments. And we'll end the session there. Kiran, over to you. Thank you, Vinayak. Just very brief comments and to bring a little energy into the discussion. Let me disagree with Ashish, on which I would normally not disagree at all. We have very similar views. He made the comment which I heard him at least is saying that the physical infrastructure is necessary to spur economic growth, which will lead to social change. And he gave a R square correlation, which is very high. But I think Amarjit has rightly in many ways countenanced that, saying, yes, there's a correlation, but it's a reverse correlation. What is cause and what is effect? You need the social infrastructure of health and education before you can get economic growth. In fact, it's a driver of economic growth, I would argue. If you had better education quality and more education, and if you had better health outcomes, you would probably drive economic growth by a percentage point more than pure physical infrastructure. But I recognize it's not either or, and I don't think he meant that. But I'm just saying let's put the social infrastructure there. Second brief point, when you talk of physical infrastructure, I, mean, I, can, I think you know this is the favorite be in my bonnet. I think we are neglecting what the purpose is. What is the definition of the problem and the question? You find there's a lot of traffic on the highways. It's going slow. You want to speed it up. What do you do? You add one more lane. So four lane highways become six lane highways. Hey, instead of that, just educate the drivers. If everybody followed lane discipline, even with four lanes, you'd get a higher speed. Invest in education, awareness creation, and try to get some maybe enforcement also going instead of just trying to broaden your highways forever and ever. So I think this is just an example for you. Third, an even more basic question, and again, it's not either or recognized, but let me put it very sharply. Do you need more highways, as in more lanes, or do you need more highways? Can you invest more in information transfer, in communication infrastructure, in optical fiber, in BharatNet, which has gone on now? I have seen it going on for 15 years. And it's yet the promise is there to go everywhere. The Prime Minister made an announcement on Redford saying every village with our high band, high speed connectivity, yet not getting there. But look at the highways, fantastic figures, great progress. People like you driving it, have driven it in the past. Who's driving this? Nobody seems very bothered. Everybody talks of it. 
And yet, if you had that, somebody mentioned hospitals. Maybe you don't need a hospital. You can do telemedicine, not as effectively, but with 90-95% effectiveness. And let the few people who are required travel, hopefully on good highways, to the hospital. You don't need a hospital in every village. Yes, you need a primary health center. But if you had better telemedicine, even that primary health center could be smaller, poorly staffed, and yet do as good or better a job on that. Final point on the CSR. You know, I have a bit of concern on some of the comments made, and I recognize what is being said. But if CSR is seen merely as a supplement to government programs, first, it's too small. Second, it doesn't make sense. The great thing about the world of civil society is that they can do things, test out things, experiment, do pilot, which the government with its large system is unable to do. And therefore, breakthroughs, new ideas, innovations, ecosystem, as Ashish rightly said, are areas to focus on. But every corporate who gives money thinks it's like a QSQT, quarter say quarter tak. So what impact did you achieve this year? How many kids did you vaccinate? How many children did you educate? That's not what civil society does best. That's not what NGOs do best. What they do is innovate, create, think of new pathways. Think of just the example given. You know, I mean, the digital infrastructure stacks, which Nandan and his team have helped to create. Working with government, but the idea, innovation came from outside. It wasn't just saying, how can we automate and put more computers and speed up the in income tax processing? Completely new thoughts. That's something else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very innovative. Well done. Now, I'm going to start from Jagan and work uh, so that you have the closing comment on the, uh, the both sides of the debate. Jagan, crisp closing comments and then we close the session. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so as a closing comment, I, I can't uh, stop myself from reminding everybody that I think one of the most important social infrastructures, I, uh, it's, it's one way to think about them, is cities. And uh, because cities thrive on the basis of the aggregation of talented, productive people, and it's social infrastructure, actually, which produces huge gains for the economy. So um, this conversation should not end without recognizing that one of our most risky propositions is also to urbanize at the pace at which we are doing without building all of the necessary infrastructure for our cities, um, both hard as well as soft. Um, and so I think this discussion should certainly uh, include the importance of that particular social infrastructure, which requires an in a tremendous amount of planning and attention which is not currently being given to it. So in a sense, we are willy-nilly, we are urbanizing, and but we kind of have to live with whatever might be the externalities of that. Um, and that has to change. Thank you. Rajneesh. Yeah, no, it's coming out very clearly that if you want to improve the productivity of Indian economy, you need to invest in human capital, which is what you're calling social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. Physical infrastructure probably gives you quicker result than the human capital is probably long term. So uh, it takes 30, 40 years to get the outcome. But when you have physical infrastructure, we have seen that the output improves dramatically. So again, I mean, if you have a limited resources, so, when it comes to allocation, can we today say, I'm talking about central government, not the state government, that 10 lakh crore instead on roads or capex on physical infrastructure should be spent on health and education? So, I'm asking a clear question that what would be the house say about this? That should be reverse. I'm leaving this question. Yeah, true. Okay. You know, well, it is nobody's case. Loudest. I think, is it working? Yeah. 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 It is nobody's case that physical infrastructure is not important. I think, you know, somewhere it was a misunderstood. It is very important for the economy. GDP is very important. Economic growth is very important. But when you look at the, you know, the your question was, is the political emphasis or government emphasis Excessive. more as compared to social? The answer to that has to be yes. I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, when you talk of physical infrastructure, a lot of private capital has come in, more can be brought in. 
So while physical infrastructure is important, private capital uh, can play a big role. You know, so government cap is investment is in, is coming in, but private capital can really supplement government investment. But when you talk of the social sector, we have not been able to come out with you know PPP models in the social sector. It is very much possible PPP can work in the social sector, but we have not <laughs> been able to come out for many reasons. It is the government investment. Which has to come go to the to the social sector, to education, to health. Health, for example, we have talked not so much of health. You know, you will be aghast if you see in some of the backward areas of the country, there are no health, you know, facilities. And government has to do it. There will be no private sector, private capital coming in there. So I think the question should have been framed rather: Have we underemphasized social infrastructure? Rather than saying overemphasize, because then it becomes a either or situation. <laughs> then it becomes either or situation. It is nobody's case that physical infrastructure is not important and economic growth is not important. But certainly we could have done more for the social infrastructure than what we have done today. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhupada. Do provocative statistics for Ashish before you Yes, sure, sure. Provocative. 2021. I'm comparing three states: Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Gujarat. Population 6 to 7 crores. Per capita incomes identical 2.5, 2.6 lakhs per capita. Multi dimensional poverty Tamil Nadu at 4.8 percent, Karnataka at 11.2 percent, Gujarat at 18.6 percent. Educating the girl child that is exactly the message that comes out of it. So, the Lan Pritchett argument this data beats the Lan Pritchett argument. That per capita incomes will do it all. It doesn't happen like that, as far as this statistic is concerned. The other statistic is 71st round NSS 2014-15. From the 42nd round, which I quoted earlier, how come in the 71st round, boys or girls, rural or urban, up to class 8, almost every child is in school? Supply side interventions of government did matter for that change. Thanks. No, look, I think it's uh, it's not an either or. Um, I think as Kiran was saying, um, my only point is at this stage, economic growth it should be our number one priority. Our number one priority, we need to grow 8% a year for the next two decades. It's our number one priority and all investment should focus on that. And let's look at it through that lens. To make that happen, exports are critical. No country in the world has achieved 8% sustained growth because the world market, as big as India is, three and a half trillion, the world market is still 25, 30 times the size of the Indian <coughs> market. And we are still 2% share in good trade. And we've been at two, stuck at 2% share for the last 20 years. You know, even in 2006, Indian exports were almost 300 billion. Now it's 450 billion. So it's ridiculous, our rate of growth. So the 10 lakh crore being spent on co-infra, I'm a big believer we're doing the right thing. I still think we need to figure out what is the highest ROI beyond that. And I agree with Jagan that if you are focused on economic growth, it is urban, urbanization. So infra in how do we, because our cities are much more productive. When people move into cities, productivity is far higher than in the countryside. And two is infrastructure that talks to industrialization, you know, industrial parks and, you know, that helps manufacturing that helps industrialization, that helps exports. So I'm still a big believer that that's where the investment needs to go. Social development doesn't really require that much money, is my only case, relative to this. So in terms of money investment, I think the binding constraint now that we have massification of education to improve outcomes is no longer capital expenditure. It is a lot of other things that we need to do. Two is, I don't think it's the binding constraint anymore. Let's take the example of the girl child. Girls today, if you look at the GER at the university level, it's higher than boys. The higher percentage of girls going to college than boys. 0.5, 0 0.8% differential. Yet, female participation in the workforce is terrible. It's not just terrible because of social norms. A lot of research shows it's terrible because we're not creating enough jobs. And all the other enabling conditions, safety, security, Etc. So I think you know we can. We've now educated the girl child. 
Actually, girls are going to all the way to college, higher percentage than boys. Yet, female participation in the workforce is terribly low. And the reason is the economic growth has not been labor intensive. We have lost the game in labor intensive exports. We have a once in a lifetime chance, as was being said earlier. China has 30 to 50 percent global market share in textiles, home interiors, sporting goods, toys, you name it. Any labor intensive export out of India's $450 billion stack, only 20 percent is labor intensive. So we've not focused on labor intensive growth. And the minute we do that, to me, that's the highest priority because that's what will create jobs and that will have the multiplier effect. I don't think the binding constraint anymore is education because of what we've done in the last 20, 30 years with the massification of education. That's the only point I'll make. Well, well said. As we move into dinner, I have a request for an intervention by this very, very iconic lady, Anjana Somani. Uh, Anjana, you wanted to say something. So, my voice is of a commoner. A little louder. I'm saying that my voice is of a commoner. And I, when we are talking about philanthropy, I see that um, uh, institutionalizing philanthropy is missing. Because there is so much money from the private sector with private charities and private trusts. But when the passionate patron is gone, many institutions just crumble. So I wanted to make this request to Mr. Dhawan to have a course because I tried to uh, I tried to you know find a course overseas in because I uh, uh, my mother's trust was passed down to me and in my view it is you know reasonably decent and I didn't know really how I should function so there was no foreign institution that offered such a course so. I think that it's very important for people to get a guidance as to how it should be structured, what one should do, how do we partner with the government, what sectors we can partner. They have a whole scheme of ITIs, only 25% you're spending your own money, 75% the government spends. But how to do that? There's so, there are so many, you know, and I do agree with... Um, I think it'll be awesome if you can create something like that. You're already doing... They have, they already have, why don't you just spend a minute talking? No, no, we, to check out. They already have a system in place to address yeah. this specific issue. So, we'll have that's, an offline that's, chat. Yes, that's wonderful. And also, I agree that the capex required is very small for education. Because I, uh, way back in 2000, I had to speak in Japan and my topic was uh, primary role of a private business house. And uh, this was in the Tokyo chamber. So, there I took, of course, agriculture, education and all that. So each time I use the example of a corporate. So I, for education, it was Aisha's example. So at that time, what I learned was that they boast of a workforce, 100% workforce, which was educated, not only the people who work, but the entire families. And they had taken up the girl-child education. And they, the corporate was spending only five rupees on each child. But it was a lot of money for the corporate because they were looking after millions of girls so the but what mr dhawan was saying that yes the capex is small so if one could guide people how to do it you know and have a template which people just pick up if you do your r d and have a template on how to open a school how to begin then it's a researched template which people can take done thank you thank you for that intervention with that we're going to close this panel discussion Welcome to drinks and dinner and this conversation is powerful enough to carry on on its own momentum. Thank you very much. Manoj, welcome. What? The question is, how are you going to carry from like this? That's obvious, that's true. Baad mein lenengi. Huh? 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 Huh?
Yeah, you can give it. Wait, wait. They want a photo op. They want a photo op. It's a hot top. I myself got some concept here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Nice. That is very good. Thank you. See you after a long time. It's good to see that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, no. Sure. Well, uh, I have a handsome. Color coordination. Yeah. That evening was wonderful. Yeah.